a bit about our research in my lab on the teenage brain. But before I do that, I want you to, tell, to put up your hand if you can see what's in this picture. So don't shout out, just put up your hand. A few of you may have seen this before. At some point, I'm going to have to change this image because everyone will start recognising it because I, I've shown it so many times in talks. Okay, I'm going to give you a clue. So that quadrant there was the image that you just saw. So the image you just saw was a cow's head. And I'm going to show you that again and put up your hand if you can see it now. Okay, so most of you can now see the cow's head in that, whereas two slides ago you couldn't. And some of you still can't, and that's perfectly normal. There are really big, in, there are really big individual differences in the time it takes for people to suddenly see these pictures. Okay, so I, this, the reason I, I'm showing you that picture will hopefully become clear right at the end of the talk. So I'm now going to change back to the, the teenage brain. I'm going to be talking about the development of the human uh, teenage brain. Um, so research in the last 15 years in neuroscience has really massively expanded in this area and we now know that the human brain undergoes really significant and protracted development right throughout adolescence and into the 20s. So adolescence is defined as the period of life that starts with puberty. So the beginning of adolescence is normally defined biologically with the hormonal and physical changes of puberty. And the end of bio uh, adolescence is defined in a much more kind of fuzzy, vague way. Normally it's defined as the age at which an individual attains an independent, stable role in society. Well, I'm going to talk about the development of the social brain, uh, particularly about how teenagers are particularly influenced by their peers and uh, decision making like risk taking is influenced by peers in the teenage years and that might be partly due to developments going on in their, in their brains, particularly the social brain. Okay, so let me tell you a bit about one of the really uh, well-known studies on risk taking that was carried out by a colleague of mine, Larry Steinberg, who's in the States. Um, a few years ago. So he had uh, different age groups come into his lab and play a driving video game like this one. So this is just like a driving arcade game. So in one condition, um, different age groups came into the lab on their own and played this game. And what you can see is that the number of crashes, which is shown here on the vertical axis, uh, and actually that was the same for any kind of risk you can measure in this kind of experiment, was about the same for each of these three age groups when they were on their own. However, in a second condition, um, the researchers asked the participants to bring a couple of friends with them, and those friends stood directly behind them when they were playing this game. Having friends st standing behind them tripled the number of risks that adolescents took and doubled the number of risks that young adults took and had no effect on the number of risks that the adults 25 and over took. This kind of peer influence on risk taking is uh, absolutely borne out by real life data. So if you look at data from car insurance companies, you see the same kind of thing. Yes, young people have more car accidents than older people, but if you look at the situation in which they're likely to have those car accidents, it's when they have a similar aged passenger in the car with them. So the critical factor in this kind of risk taking appears to be peer influence. Under optimal conditions, here in the lab when they're on their own, adolescents can make good decisions and not take too many risks, but when they have their friends with them, that's when uh, decision making changes. So the idea here is that maybe adolescents really care about being socially excluded. I mean, we all care about not being socially excluded. We don't want to be excluded by the, our social groups. But perhaps adolescents are particularly susceptible to the, to the worrying feeling of being ostracised by their social group. Well, it's all pretty groundbreaking because it's so new, such a new field, and there are still you know, huge numbers of questions that have yet to be asked, uh, and, and let alone answered. Uh, but we're discovering that the brain is very malleable and plastic through the teenage years. It, the um, adolescent brain development represents a, a, a period of kind of opportunity for learning and creativity because the brain is so plastic and developing so rapidly. But it also uh, represents a period of vulnerability. The, um, the onset of mental illness increases a lot during the teenage years, and that might be to do with uh, the development of the teenage brain. The limbic system in red uh, processes things like emotions and reward, the rewarding feeling that you get out of risk-taking, for example. It's the, it's the region of the brain that gives you the kick out of risk-taking. Whereas the prefrontal cortex in blue is what inhibits you from risk-taking. 
what it, what tell, it's what stops you from taking a risk. It, what, it's what stops you from speeding down the motorway at 90 miles an hour, for example, or whatever, whatever other example you want to think of. And the idea of this theory is that these regions develop at different rates. The idea put forward about 10 years ago uh, is that the limbic system is fully functioning and developed in early adolescence, whereas the prefrontal cortex takes much longer to develop. So there's a mismatch between the region of the brain that gives you the kick out of taking risks and the emotion versus the region of the brain that stops you taking risks. So it's like the accelerator is there, the limbic system, but the brakes aren't there yet. That's the prefrontal cortex. I work with teachers a lot. So I run a neuroscience lab, but in my lab we go out into schools a lot and test uh, kids in schools and I have a lot of dealings with teachers. Um, but I also, yeah, I know a lot of teachers, I work with a lot of teachers and, and give talks at lots of schools and education conferences. So I don't want you to go away thinking, oh right, the adolescent brain develops and then it stops at about 20 or 30 and then that's it, the brain never changes again. That's not the message that I want to give. In fact, we know that neuroplasticity is happening all the time in all of our brains. There's no age limit to brain plasticity. Whenever you learn something new, whether it's a new word or a new face or a new root home, something in your brain has changed and we know that there's no age limit to that. And that is why I showed you this brain picture, because now I expect most of you can recognise instantly what this picture is. And that's because a few thousand synapses in your brains have changed in the last uh, 30 minutes that now allow you to recognise that picture. And probably if I come back in five years' time and show this to you again, you'll be able to recognise it first time round. And that's because that plasticity is long-lasting. Questions, if we may. Uh, anybody, any questions for Professor Blake? Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Um, I suppose we're all concerned with that risk-taking attitude that you talked about, um, and we're all keen to create an environment in which they can take risks, but obviously it has to be controlled. One thing that becomes increasingly frustrating for me as a head teacher is having created that environment of risk. Um, what freedom we give the children to fail or to reap the consequences of that risk? And the question is, I wondered if you've done any research around the consequences of them taking risks but then failing and how that changes their, their, their brain moulding, or whether they take risks but then get bailed out, and whether the brain develops in a slightly different way to adolescent, uh, sorry, to adulthood uh, around risk-taking in the future. That's a really interesting question, thank you. Risk-taking and failing and things going wrong is, are really important uh, skills for a child and an adolescent to learn. And actually, by adolescence, it's sort of almost not too late, but you know, it's, they need to start learning that before adolescence and having a bit of freedom to take risks themselves. Um, yeah, and it, even even worse, if you don't let, if you don't allow an adolescent to, an adolescent to fail or take risks, then what kind of adult? will they be when they go out and live on their own and have to deal with their own lives. So I think, you know, this is a, this is a, adolescence is a period of life that's a really important developmental period. It's not something that we want to reduce in length or anything like that. It's the period of life where they're developing a sense of self, a self-identity and particularly a sense of social self. Um, you can't get there, you know, quick, quickly. There's no shortcut. And part of that is to explore and make mistakes and take risks. Thank you again for a fascinating talk. I've just come from a seminar on adolescent mental health. Has neuroscience anything to, any light to shine on that particular problem? I'm so glad you asked that question. So the reason I became interested in the adolescent brain is because I did my PhD and a postdoc on schizophrenia. And schizophrenia, as you might know, is a condition that, a hor horrendous psychiatric condition that normally has its onset at the end of adolescence. The average age is between 18 and 25. And I think this is about 10 or 12 years ago. I became interested in why this is. Why does schizophrenia have its onset? It's a developmental disorder, but it develops late. Why does it have its onset at the end of adolescence? Is that something to do with brain development going wrong in, in the teenage years and in, in people who then develop schizophrenia? Now, that was 12 years ago. And like I've implied during my talk, there was very little known about even typically developing adolescent brains back then. And that's when I decided to make that the focus of my research. Now, it's not just schizophrenia. Uh, it's been estimated that 75% of adult mental disorder has its onset before the age of 24, and mostly during the period of adolescence. This is 
this is a period of opportunity, and that's why I suppose what I've been talking about today. There's a flip side to that coin, which is that it's also, because of the brain development and brain plasticity, a period of vulnerability. Probably uh, the, the developing and plastic brain during adolescence makes the adolescent brain particularly susceptible to negative social uh, and environmental factors as well as positive ones. 